Anyway, we're in the um, book of Mark. We're um, in chapter 13 now. And uh, as we approach this particular area of Scripture, as we draw our attention to this area of Scripture, something to consider and think about for us is what our particular view is of the world. How do we see the world? What is our understanding of the world and our understanding of our life in this world? So we are people that are, are constantly being subjected to ideologies and philosophies and influences of the world. We're in the world, but the Bible tells us not to be of the world. And that's not easy, is it? It's not easy to navigate those tricky waters. But I think the first thing is just to understand really what the world is and, and where it's headed and what's going to happen. We live in a time where it's a, it seems like on people's mind constantly, not just believers, but unbelievers, uh, of the world seems like it's in trouble. The world seems like it's sort of in a, in a place of distress. And if we were to sort of look at it logically, we, we would see that it, it just doesn't seem like it's getting better and going somewhere where it's this big utopia. It actually seems like the opposite. It seems like it, it, it's like, like crescendoing into some sort of free fall. And I think, you know, believer and unbeliever alike, I, I think that's sort of a, a feeling generally of, of people. And it seems like just, uh, just something's really wrong and, and really out of place. And, and so as we look at the Bible, it's interesting because the Bible actually tells us that there's an end to the world as we know it. There's an end to the world as we know it. And the book of Daniel actually gives us the blueprint of how it's going to happen. And the book of Daniel actually also gives us the schedule of how it's going to happen. So in Daniel chapter 2, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, is given a vision of sort of a, a statue or a figure or a man. And uh, he asked Daniel for uh, his interpretation of it. And Daniel gives, the, um, gives that interpretation that the Lord gave him about it. And what we find is that that image that Nebuchadnezzar is seeing in a dream that's being interpreted by Daniel is actually the framework for the world and how it's going to end up. And it gives us a description of four world powers. And those four world pow powers, from our standpoint right now, are historical. From Daniel's standpoint, they were prophetical. So we live in a time that's really amazing. So we can look back and see what Daniel said about the future and we can see how the things about the future that Daniel said were fulfilled literally. So what was he talking about? Well, he was talking about four world, world kingdoms that would be on the earth that would culminate with a fifth world kingdom and that fifth world kingdom would end with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth to restore all things. So what were those kingdoms? Well, Nebuchadnezzar was in power at the time, and he was the king of what? Babylon. Was Babylon at one time a world power? Absolutely. And then the prophecy continues that then that Babylonian empire would be conquered by another empire. And that other empire would be the Medo-Persian empire. Did that happen historically? Absolutely. Medo-Persians conquered the Babylonians, became a world power, and then the prophecy continues that there would be another world power that would conquer the earth. Any guesses? The Grecian empire. 
So remember, these are all things that Daniel's prophesying before those, the Grecian Empire was even on the radar. That wasn't even a thing. Before the Medo-Persian Medo Empire was even a thing. And so those things actually happened. So Alexander the Great, the Grecian Empire, you could read that history, it's historical information. And then he said then there would be uh, another kingdom that would conquer the, the Grecian Empire, and that would be the Roman Empire. Did that happen? So the Roman Empire conquered the world. In fact, in the time of Jesus, in the time of Mark chapter 13, the Roman Empire was ruling the world, and they conquered the Medo-Persian Empire. But then, then the, this is still future then, so we have four-fifths of this prophecy, and, and the fifth part is there would be a, a revival of that Roman Empire. And that final empire, which is future for us, will be sort of a, a revival of Western culture, and it'll be a revival of European dominance headed by ten nations in Europe in which the Antichrist will rise from and rule the world. And so that's still future. But it ends like this. And th this is how, how we know this particular scripture is speaking about the end of the world as we know it. Daniel chapter 2 verse 34 says this. The stone that was cut without hands. So that's a reference to Jesus, to the Messiah. A stone that was not cut with hands. He wasn't made. But he was the Messiah. He was eternal. The stone that was cut without hands struck the image on its feet of iron and clay. So that's the last empire, the revived Roman Empire. And the ten toes represent the, the ten uh, nations that sort of rise out of Europe to, conform, uh, to form this confederation. And it says, the stone cut with, not cut with hands will break them in pieces, these world, this world power. And then it says, and then the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So this is language that is telling us the whole blueprint and schedule of how the world's going to come to an end. But then in Daniel chapter 9, it actually gives us the schedule then of, of how that's actually going to be going to be played out. And it, it, it explains it by saying there are 70 weeks assigned to the nation of Israel, and then comes the end. And so through that prophecy, as, as Daniel's giving that prophecy, then he's saying things that he could not really know at that point. And he's actually giving details about the time frame. And he says in that scripture, in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 30, he says that these 70 weeks, which are actually 70, seven-year periods. So when you start saying things like that, you can actually start figuring things out, like numbers. And so you go from a certain point, and you put... 70, seven-year periods, and you sort of add that up, but the starting point was given to us too. And it, the starting point was when a decree would go out that the nation of Israel, who at the time was in captivity to the Babylonians, that there would be a de decree that would go out that they would be able to go back and restore and rebuild their nation and the temple. And that actually happened. That actually happened. And so we can count from that point and end up to the place where the Messiah will come. And that was 483 years. And people that are smarter than me have been able to figure out what the differences of the calendars and leap years and things like that, 
that the day that Jesus rode in was the exact day, 483 years to the day where the decree went out and then Jesus rode in to Jerusalem. But then something interesting happens. Between the 69th week and the 70th week, Daniel tells us there's going to be a pause, and he actually tells us that, that the Messiah will be cut off. And so there's a pause. And then the clock starts again. Daniel tells us when a covenant is made between Israel and what will end up being the Antichrist. That will start the clock of the last week of the planet Earth as you know it. And that is the 70th week of Daniel. And that is still yet future. We are still in the pause right now. But as we're in the pause right now, we, we know as the, the Bible spells out for us, there, there's things what we know. That there, there is actually going to be an end to the world as we know it. What does that mean exactly? Well, it means that Jesus is going to come back to the earth to restore all things. So all, all the, how everything is just so messed up and so difficult. Now, this isn't the way that God designed it. This is the way that man made it. And so Jesus is going to come back and he's going to rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years and he's going to restore all things so that's that's future and so as we look at that and we we understand the Bible is very explicit and implicit about us understanding the things that we've just talked about the Bible wants us to know these things and does not want us to be ignorant about the things of the end times and so it's interesting that we find ourselves in much of the church of our day saying that they don't talk about Bible prophecy because they want to focus on life now. They want to focus on the gospel and they want to focus on what's going on now. And that's correct. We should do that, but not by ignoring what's going to happen on earth. And in fact, chapter 13 of the book of Mark, which is also in Matthew 24 and also in Luke 21, is the longest answer that Jesus has given or ha gives in the scriptures at all. And so we see there's a significance, there's an emphasis, there's an importance that's being placed on understanding the times that we're living in, understanding what God says about the future, and then living our life accordingly. And that's, that's one of the purposes of Bible prophecy, of, of telling us here's what's going to happen, is so we don't get too invested in the things of the world. It, it, it's so we, we look at the world and, and we understand that this world is fleeting. It's fading away. It's not a place where we should look to to find our happiness, to find our hope, to find our purpose. And this is what Jesus is actually emphasizing in Matthew chapter 13 as we work our way through this particular text over the next couple weeks or so. Now, in Romans chapter 8, I'll read it for you. Feel free to turn there, but just going to be here really quick. Romans chapter 8, 18 through 22. Apostle Paul is sort of giving us this sort of dual understanding of the difference between the world, the world kingdom and God's kingdom. And he says this, Romans 8, 18, For I consider the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Do you see the emphasis? The Apostle Paul is not ignoring the reality of the world 
at this particular time, but what he is saying is the reality of the world in comparison to the future glory puts this world in the right perspective. If we don't put the world as we know it now in perspective of future glory, we're going to feel hopeless. We're going to feel as if things just seem to be going from bad to worse. But the Apostle Paul paints this amazing picture for us so that, that we understand that we live in this particular reality right now and we don't need to be those who try to act like the reality isn't there, but instead we have a greater hope. Our hope is not in the world. But he goes on and he says, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God for the creation was subjected to futility not willingly but because of him who subjected it in hope because creation itself will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. See, do you see what he's, he's doing is he's acknowledging, man, if you look around, it even seems like God's creation is moaning. It's just waiting for this redemption and longing for this new day. And as, as we live our life, we have this particular hope that the Apostle Paul is telling us that, that our, our hope is in Jesus and we can actually have that hope now. We don't just have to say, well, it's terrible here and when I die, I'll be with Jesus. But he actually says we can have that hope now as we read Romans chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, that's how we're made right with God, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through Him, whom we also have access by faith into His grace, in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, which that's a lot, but we also glory in our tribulations. Do you glory in your tribulations? You don't have to answer that. You know who glories in their tribulations is the one who has the right perspective about their life in this world. That's, that's who does that. Because one who has the right perspective of their life in this world knows that tribulations do something. Do something that we want. Do something to further our relationship with God. So he, he explains that. So he says this, and not only that, but we also glory in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. Do we need perseverance? I do. And perseverance leads to character, and character leads to hope. Now, hope does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. So we look at those scriptures and, and what Paul is saying is that we can recognize the state and the condition of the world. We can see in the Bible that there's actually going to be an end to it. We see how that's all going to work. We see God working to 
uh, according to his schedule. We see four-fifths of Daniel chapter 2 have been completed. We see 69 weeks out of the 70 have been completed. And so we can look and we, we maybe can see a finish line. But not only that, it's not just the finish line. Then we can actually know that, that while we're here, then God will work in our life to sort of bring heaven into our heart. That we can enjoy the Lord now before we go and be with Him. This is what Paul is saying. But you know, you know how difficult it seems for believers to get a hold of that concept? And the, the way we would know that, that we've sort of actually got a hold of that concept, that understanding, is that, that we'd glory in our tribulations. Or as James says, that we would count it all joy. So you see, we, we don't like that. But the, the understanding of the things that we experience in this world develop the inward qualities and characteristics that bring forth such amazing peace and love and joy and these things we find all of them in Christ so no matter what we're going through we experience we can't experience those in Christ and even though as, as Paul would say in 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 even though our outward man is is perishing our inner inward man is going from glory to glory so we can't lose we don't lose. This is the worst it ever gets. And, and then we go to be with the Lord and it's eternity with Him face to face. But right now it's a, a more of a battle, isn't it? And part of that battle is just to understand and submit to the will of God. Trusting God, allowing God to work in our life. But see, this is exactly in our text what Jesus is trying to anchor into the heart's of the disciples because Jesus knew what was ahead for them the disciples didn't know what was ahead for them but what they thought was ahead for them very quickly like in their minds in a matter of days was that Jesus would restore all things and put the Jewish nation in dominance and prominence in Israel in Jerusalem on the earth and their whole hope was in that. So let's look at this. And we're going to spend a couple weeks working our way through this chapter. But let's look at this particular chapter and, and understand that, that Jesus, in his last hours here, before his crucifixion, is making this a huge emphasis. Their, their correct understanding of the future. So that they can correctly live their life in the presence, in the present. So notice verse 1. Then as Jesus went out of the temple, one of the disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. So as Jesus spends his last days and now last hours sort of roaming through the temple area and being challenged by the Herodians, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the chief priests, all these religious representatives of supposedly the kingdom of God, but they're challenging him. They're trying to catch him. They're trying to trap him. They're trying to to bring him to a place where they can kill him. That's what they wanted to do. And so as Jesus is sort of going around and dealing with these confrontations, now he begins to sort of teach. Instead of just responding, he's done responding. And you remember the responses were that they didn't have anything to say to his responses. And so now, sort of, He's transitioning now and he's directing his, his conversations now to his disciples who are going to carry out his work. And so now we see this as we understand 
really the only hope for the world, the disciples display that they are now leaning on a false hope. Because they're telling Jesus, and you kind of get a braggadocious type of feel, and they're saying, look at those stones. Look at the architecture. Look at the amazing work that has been done and what they were pointing out was the the temple the temple area which for the Jewish people was their identity they could even swear by the temple that was the place where the operations of religion were but not only that the operations of politics was so that was their area and they would see that and they would feel a sense of identity they would feel a connection to the building and those uh, buildings that, that structure was impressive it was a rebuilt temple by Herod and this rebuilding project was still going when Jesus was there and would continue until 64 AD and these Impressive buildings were now something that the disciples were pointing at. And they wanted Jesus to see. They wanted Jesus to recognize how amazing these structures were. And it is because in their minds they had a, a lot of pride in those structures, but those structures also represented that God was with them in their minds. Even though that we have seen that God was not with them. And so we have this presentation that Jesus wants to expose. He's trying to, to expose to his disciples that they're putting their hope and their trust in something that doesn't go beyond what they can see, touch, feel, and experience with their physical senses. And as they sort of lean on, think about a, a picture I get is just sort of they're, they're leaning on the stones of this temple. They're, they're sort of looking at that, and every day they would see this temple, and they, they would feel like, well, we're okay. We got this temple. That's what we got. And what, what we find, what you'll find, what I find, what I have found and continue to find, is that anything I sort of lean on that makes me feel good about my future, anything that I put my hope in that is not of the Lord, Any, anything that sort of kind of gives me a, a sense that, you, you know, I, I have this much in my bank account, I'm okay. That makes me feel good. We should not lean on those things. Our hope should not be in those things. And see, maybe this morning the Lord just wants to, to move the dial a little bit in our grasp of our life in this world. And maybe there are things that we're holding on and just kind of makes us feel a little secure, makes us feel a little better, but it's not the Lord. And see, the Lord will strip us of those things because He loves us. Those are idols. Those are things that will come crashing down. Those are things that won't sustain. And so this false hope then leads Jesus into this answer, the longest answer that he has given or ever gives in Scripture. And he says in verse 2, he, he answered and he says, you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. That was a shocking statement. Jesus has just put himself in a position where he's prophesying about something that's going to happen. And if it didn't happen, he would be a false prophet. But not only that, what he's doing is he's exposing the heart of what they're really trusting in. Now remember, the audience is not, his, not the people that are coming against him, not his enemies. His audience are his disciples. And at this point, he's going to go up on the Mount of Olives just across the Kidron Valley and they would be able to 
view the whole temple complex, and Jesus is going to explain about these things. But do you notice what Jesus does? He takes their misunderstanding and exposes their misunderstanding so that he can deal with that. Because if their misunderstanding is a misunderstanding that is, is a, a worldly misunderstanding, and that doesn't get corrected, then they are going to be set up for massive failure. And so Jesus says, look at that building. And you can imagine how long it took for them to build that building and how big the stones were and how impressive this building was. You're talking, uh, some of the stones were 100 ton stones and all placed on each other and this beautiful thing. And he says, see, you see all those stones? Not, not one of them is going to stand. That would be a shocking statement. That would be a statement that would be hard to reconcile. That'd be a statement that would be very disconcerting. But that, isn't that what it's like when the Lord sort of moves our understanding of things into a correct understanding? Sometimes those moves of the needle are very difficult. And sometimes we have in our minds a, a fixed way of understanding things and, and the Lord is growing us in those understandings and one of the ways He does it is He allows us to be stripped of things that we hold so tightly to. And He does that to free us from the bondage of us holding on to something that really is an idol. So it says in verse 3 now, as, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, so now he's on the Mount of Olives on the other, other side of the Kidron Valley looking at the temple. And Peter, James, John, and Andrew came to him privately. And so they say, tell us when these things, tell us when these things will be, and what sign when all these things will be fulfilled. So they want to know, just like we want to know, when is this going to happen? When is Jesus coming back? And, and how do we know? Are there signs that we're going to see that sort of give us an indication or something that, that happens in the world that we can kind of point to and, and say, well, that's one of those things. That's what Jesus said. He said that, and now look, it's happening. So very, very interesting. So the first thing, so let's just get this settled together. The first thing, if we're going to understand where true hope comes from, is we first have to understand that there is false hope, and the Lord is looking to remove false hope from our heart. And maybe today you have something that you're holding on to that's not of the Lord, and maybe the Lord wants you to just recognize that and understand that. But then as we transition to what he says next and the answer he's given, it's very interesting. It's very profound. It's very insightful because what he does, contrary to the belief of the disciples at that time who thought this, this is what their thought was. They thought, okay, if Jesus is the Messiah, He's going to set up His kingdom now on earth. So think about that. Think about if that happened. Then there would be no salvation. There would just be a, a temporary time where uh, the nation of Israel would do better. But there wouldn't be Jesus on the cross. There wouldn't be the shedding of blood for our sins. And so... Jesus is now laying out something that would be unfamiliar that he's going to come twice, first to save, then to restore later. And he actually explains that there's going to be a time gap in between. So he's going to explain to them what it's like. What is it going to be like in this time before the comings, the first coming and the second coming? And so for those who have a romantic idea about a world utopia. 
and the world becoming this amazing place where, like John Lennon imagines, everybody will be li living in peace and harmony. The only problem is we have a wicked and corrupt heart. And we live in a fallen world that is under the influence of Satan. So there's no utopia here. There's no paradise here. This is not heaven. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and it's not going to get better. You say, oh, you're so negative. <laughs> That's just what the Bible says. It's not going to get better. It's actually, you got it. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. So let's look at this false hope and now the reality check of the ferocious times that exemplify the world. So here's Jesus' answer in verse 5. Jesus, answering them, he began to say, take heed. What does that mean? We don't say that a lot, right? Honey, take heed to that uh, restaurant we just drove by. They're having a special on a bag of burgers. <laughs> You don't say that, but take heed is an, actually an interesting word. It means to actually see, to discern. So the Bible calls us to look at things in a discerning way. What does discerning way mean? Where we understand how it fits into God's plan. So he says, take heed that no one deceives you. Deceives you. That's crazy because Jesus is saying that the times that are marked in between his first coming and second coming, the time that we live in, is going to be characterized by deceit. That means people are, are going to demonically try to influence you, to confuse you, to get you to look at the world incorrectly to get you to think incorrectly. And, and Jesus is correcting the disciples in that. And he's doing that. He's saying there's going to be destruction of the temple, but also understand there's going to be deception. Man, do we see that now? I mean, how do you know? Any, how do you know if anything's right? How do, you, how do you understand what's reality or not? Does the news tell you? Can you look at the news stations and say, well, that's what's going to be right. They're, they're just reporting the news. The news is a propaganda factory. So how do you know? Well, I got social media. That's even more of a propaganda factory. And that's actually been exposed and proven that the social media companies are actually being used to promote certain ideologies. You say, well, I have TikTok, so that settles everything. Well, China owns TikTok. And their TikTok in China is different than the TikTok in America. And there's a reason for that. TikTok in America is showing, well, you know what they show, but usually girls dancing or whatever, inappropriate, many inappropriate things. In China, they show math and science and architecture. It's different. That's because it's propaganda. And so how do you know? That should make your Bible that much more valuable to you. Because that's all we have. And you say, well, I can go to a church and find out the truth. No, you can't. Not in every case. Hopefully in some cases. But we've seen in the history of Israel where the priesthood was supposed to be those who brought forth the things of God and the truth of God, that got corrupted. And, and not only that, the prophets, during the times of the prophets, there were false prophets. So how do you know? The, the Word of God is all you have. That's it. And so, if you're going to survive a time of de deception, you have to, have to know the Word of God. You have to master the Word of God and have the Word of God master you. That should be your thing. That should be my thing. The Word of God should be our thing. Right? It shouldn't 
be an extra thing or some other. The Word of God should be our thing. That's the thing. And if you're going to survive during a time of deception, you need to know the truth because it is the truth that sets you free. But then he goes on. The times before the comings are going to be marked by deception and there's going to be the destruction of the temple prior to that, which, by the way, actually happened in 70 A.D. So Jesus' prophecy was fulfilled in 70 A.D. But then he says in verse 7, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And isn't it true that it just seems like there's wars going on, and then there's always a speculation, or there might be war, or these people are close to war, and, and all these things. But note this, this has marked human history. This has marked human history. And that's why what Jesus says next is, he says, don't be troubled. Do you know why he says that? Because it's the recognition of the reality of the world. See, when we're troubled, when we hear... Russia and Ukraine are at war, or Israel might be bombed, or Israel might bomb somebody else. We're troubled because we have a misconception about this world that it's going to be free from war in utopia, but that's never going to happen. So we shouldn't be troubled because we realize, well, yeah, that's the world we live in. We live in a world that has been marked by savagery and people hurting each other and wanting to hurt each other and to conquer each other. And that's not going to change. So he says, don't be troubled when you hear it. Notice what he says next. For such things, they, ha they have to happen. Isn't that interesting? So wars and rumors of war are actually fulfilling prophecy and the plan of God. But notice what he says next. The end is not yet. What does that mean? Jesus is saying that destruction of the temple, deception, and wars and rumors of war, that's not the end. He's saying this is a characteristic of the times that you're in. In other words, those things that we mention in Matthew 24 is a, a more in-depth account. But what we read is those aren't signs in and of themselves. You know what the sign is of those things? This is hugely important. The sign is that the things mentioned are going to increase in frequency and in intensity. That's the sign. So he's saying that the, the world is fallen, the world is dark, the world is bleak, it's under the sway of the enemy, and he's saying all that, and he's saying those, that's not the sign, that's a characteristic of the world that you live in, don't put your hope in there, but he's saying, but, and Matthew points this out, when those things increase in intensity and frequency, that should get your attention. Now something's being birthed, and he gives the analogy of birth pangs. And we see that. We see the intensity and frequency of these things mentioned. And so that's the sign. We see those things and we see them. They're coming faster and faster and faster. And they're more intense and more intense and more intense. So that should get our attention. So, and then in verse 8 it says, For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And then he gives another characteristic of the days and times that we live in. There will be earthquakes in various places, and famines, and troubles. And these are what? The beginning of sorrows. See, that's important. So that's saying, and the sorrows is a reference to a woman in labor pain. So that's the analogy. That's the sign. And he says, when you see these things, so we know where we are in the world, we know the blueprint, we know the schedule, we know Jesus is going to come back at, at one point, we know 
uh, from Daniel 2 and Daniel 9, the majority of things that have ha had to happen have already happened. And we're just in this time is sort of just, just waiting for that next foot to drop. And we're told to, to really cue in to the intensity and the frequency because these are the beginning of sorrows. It's not the end. Some people have the standpoint that the world's going to get better and then Jesus, Jesus is coming back. That's not true. These are the beginning of sorrows. It's going to be, get worse, and it's going to get an all-time high worse in the tribulation period. And so we'll end with this. Here's the good news. As Jesus continues to point out the characteristics of the age that we live in, there's a sliver of hope. So he continues and he says, Watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you to councils. And this actually happened literally to the disciples. And you will be beaten in synagogue. So remember, the disciples thought, this is it. Jesus is going to, they didn't think they're going to have to go through any of this. You will be beaten in the synagogue. You will be brought before the rulers and the kings for my sake. So they would be brought between the Jewish authorities and the non-Jewish authorities. And that's actually exactly what happened in the book of Acts. And it says, you'll be brought before them for a testimony to them. Do you see that? There's a silver lining. There's purpose to our suffering. There's meaning to what may happen to us. And it is this, that God will place us in positions in order to share the gospel with those that we are in front of. So there's a purpose. And we have to understand, as we understand the things that we're talking about today, then that puts a prerogative on our life as believers of sharing the gospel. And not when we get in a difficult situation saying, woe is me, but instead count it all joy and saying, wow, now I have a chance to share the gospel with this person I'm in front of. But see, only a person that has a right view of this world can say that. Only a person that has a right view of their eternity and where their real hope lies can say that. So he says, but when they uh, arrest you, I'm sorry, verse 10, it says, and the gospel first must, must be preached to all the nations. So what that's saying is that no matter what adversity and obstacle, no matter how the world tries to stop the church that proclaims Jesus Christ, it'll never work. The gospel is going to be proclaimed throughout all the world. You think about how amazing a prophecy that is? He's telling 12 disciples who don't even know their right hand from their left hand. And those 12 disciples, without the communication techniques that we have, have been instrumental in spreading the gospel across the whole world. That's amazing. It's amazing that we're here worshiping God on the foundation of what's being said here. In Flower Mound, Texas. And this is in Israel, in Jerusalem happening. And here we are. This is a prophecy that God has fulfilled. But he, he says, don't worry when you get put in these positions. He even says, don't premeditate when you speak, but whatever is given you that hour, speak that, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. So he's telling them, and remember, they don't even really know much about the Holy Spirit yet. Pentecost hasn't even happened yet. And he's foretelling, don't worry, just Submit your will to me and let me carry and direct your life. And when you get in a place that God has put you to proclaim the gospel, then do that. But don't worry about what you're going to say. Just show up and I'll say it through you. You can't lose. We can't lose. And then finally, he says this. Now, brother will betray brother. Characteristic of the times that we live in is betrayal that's going to get worse and worse and worse. A father will betray his child and children will rise up 
against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And then there will be mass hatred in verse 13. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Think about that. We see this sort of simmering, don't we? We see this pressure boiling. We've seen, uh, especially the last couple years in, in the Western culture, in Canada and Australia, and now you know, getting here more, and it's going to get worse and worse. The Christian persecution. There is a hatred of Christians, and that's going to get worse. And so we, we see all these characteristics of the times that we live in. We shouldn't think it strange when we see these things, but he says, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And there's our hope. Our hope is not if we make it to the end, we'll be saved. What he's saying is the evidence of your relationship with God will be shown and demonstrated in your perseverance through the trials. What it's saying is that you cannot go through the things of this world and the persecutions of this world the way God wants you to unless you are truly born again. And so all of this, as we sort of just begin this chapter, looking at this chapter, just really all comes down to this one thing. And it's, it's where our hope is, and it's in Jesus Christ. The only hope for the world, the only hope for you and I, the only thing that we can count on, that we can rely on, that we can build our life on, is Jesus Christ. And this morning, may we understand and get in our hearts that Jesus is everything. And maybe if there's something we're keeping back, something we're relying on, something that may be even an idol in our heart, maybe today we can just say, Lord, help me to not count my life dear to myself, as Paul said, so that I may run my race with joy. So when we surrender our life and all that may happen to us to the Lord, that's where our joy comes in running our race. So is Jesus everything to you? Is Jesus your sustainer, your hope? Is Jesus your satisfaction, your love? And how about this? Is Jesus' will the one that you gladly surrender to? This is what Jesus is saying to his disciples. And this is what Jesus is challenging us with this morning. So let's pray.